Cousin Jared, we are back for week two. We are distracted, but we are yes. back. Uh, yep. We are currently recording during the first quarter of LSU Florida State, so <clears throat> you'll find out along with us uh, if 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 you know if someone gets a little distracted. You know that that's why we're we're, we're yep. kind of trying to keep an eye on that game as well. Um, if we get a sense of dread, it's probably because like an offense did something good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, we we had the under fifty eight, and that uh, was looking good for for a little while here. Well, who knows? Right by the time this show ends, we might <clears throat> completely change our minds on that. Um, what a recap uh, week one a little bit first to let everyone know uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna go two episodes a week now so we've been you know people are asking for a second episode we're gonna do a totals episode here on Sundays and then on Mondays uh, Monday nights we're gonna do a, a sides episode picking mostly money lines we're gonna kind of <clears throat> talk about that shift here uh, at some point but um, uh, for tonight we have totals this week's a little bit weird the model is not completely fully baked yet because not every game is completed from week one. Um, so we've got some updates on some of these and some early projections, but they're all subject to change based off how the week finishes up. Uh, Cousin Jared, week one, it wasn't great for us. Uh, we don't, you know, <clears throat> hide from that. We'll say was tracking along the money lines. We went to the money lines in college basketball and that proved insanely profitable. I've long said, I thought the money lines are a better move, uh, a more advantageous bet, because as long as you're following someone like me who understands probability and can do some math, we can find edges in the long run. That's kind of, we're going to try to shift. We're not going to take minus 1500s and we're not going to take plus 1000s. We're going to mostly focus money lines on the closer to even money uh, games, but it worked really well in college basketball. So it's kind of, a little bit of a shift that I think can can just find us some more edges. They did better than the spreads did in week one, and, and I don't really see why that would be any different. I think that's kind of going to be the way it works out. Because, uh, Jared, I know you're excited about the change. I am excited about the change because I'm not a math person. I'm, I've mentioned on the show before I'm not an athlete. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist. Uh, but what I do know about psychology is I like our incentives to be aligned. And so money line feels like that allows my incentives, for the most part, to be directly tied to the incentives of the team that we're backing. So, um, you know, just from a psychological perspective, I feel like I can get behind that change. Which is a great segue to talking about week one, losing Louisville on a Friday night where we laid, you know, about a touchdown and they were outside that number at the end, uh, kicked a field goal, which didn't matter. And then played, did, did played prevent defense and give up a score. And we were then got back toward off of that. That was a weird game. And some people can say whether who should have won or not or whatever, but uh, Louisville scored a ton <clears throat> of times where had one good quarter. I, I think we had the right side. Uh, some people can disagree with that, but the money line part of that makes that a little bit nicer. Um, the key to the money in plays on the start tree, you know, we scaling our picks. It's what we did in college basketball. You're not always trying to win one unit. Maybe we cut that to try to win a half a unit. And that's still a strong play. We're seeing two and a half units to one half a unit or something. And the bottom line is as long as we win with a higher probability uh, than the implied odds, <clears throat> you know, it'll be a, a favorable play for us. Uh, but that's kind of what it felt like happened in week one. We got a really lucky break with Penn state at the very tail end of the night, yeah. I think scoring a light, getting us the over and Penn cover. And that was like the only shred of good luck. I feel like we had Oh, yeah. and that was good luck after uh, West Virginia scored really late and we were going to split and it looked like we we're going to lose both. <clears throat> so we got good luck to get back to the, our good luck took us basically from overcoming the bad luck to go from one win to two in that yeah. game. But we, we had a lot of bad luck and cousin Jared, I think, I want to wrap up this discussion with just this thought, right? And I, you know, by viewing the world and probability the way we do, we're never right or wrong. Everything is about a probability when we observe one game, it wins or it loses. But, you know, that's not the way that we can grade based off that one game. Yeah. Because... It, it, you know, it, it's about the, the accumulation. That's where probabilities come into play, right? Are you yep. right more than you're wrong? That sort of thing. But as much as I do believe we are never truly right or truly wrong, we view the world's of probabilities. And if we say 60% probability, we understand 40% things happen all the time. I have to say being on the under in TCU, Colorado felt very wrong. And so from the there is wrong. Yeah. From the get go, it should have been over by halftime. <laughs> and it mercifully wasn't for us, but it eventually got there with ease anyway. And there is a fine line between we view the world in probabilities, which means 
you know, we view one realization, we don't overreact, but also we have to sometimes think about how we're coming up with those probabilities, the model, how we're adjusting. Obviously, after week one, there's a lot of adjustments. This is a fun week to try to figure out what do you react to appropriately, what do you overreact to? And there's a lot happening trying to figure out where do you just stick with that was one real realization to I have to completely rethink how I'm viewing this team. What are your thoughts on this? I completely agree with you. I think a big, big part of college football um, betting and, you know, looking at the odds and totals or whatever it might be is you have to determine what did you see that was real? What could change apps like you instantly need to change like for example, I think Texas A&M might have a quarterback and offensive coordinator that's fairly competent and is now actually forcing the head coach to do head coach things and not call plays. So, like, I think that's something that you can take away from week one, just as an example. Yeah. Um, and there's other things where you're like, well, this game just got a little crazy. Like, there's no need to draw too many conclusions from that. Like, for example, you looked at, um, let's say that Wyoming scored 35 points. I, I don't know how many times the rest of the season Wyoming is going to score 35 points. So, I don't think you need to well, go well, next week. Wyoming scored 30. 15 of them, 15 of them were in overtime, right? So that's part of well, the reason why. Exactly. Wipe off the 15 from overtime. And then you got a team that's, you know, playing fast like Tech is. That's, a, a, you know, increasing the number of possessions that Wyoming has. You're going to play some Mountain West teams that don't do that. So anyway, yeah, that's just an example. Uh, but yeah, Wyoming and Air Force that. are definitely playing a 17 to 6 game later this season. Like it's 100%, 100%. happening. Yeah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> Based up what I saw Wyoming. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, a lot of things that we, we got right, a lot of things that we didn't, a lot of things that, again, you just just say that was bad luck that was weird that was a coin toss game those one score games were a lot of games you know just one thing goes differently it flips the result you're on the right side you're on the wrong side right and, but there are a lot of things like you said with texas a&m for instance yeah. you know where we took the under in that it was like hey we're gonna have to readjust <clears throat> and the models have to react and it will react of course to saying they played faster they, they ran more plays that's yeah. part of what goes into the model they have a little bit of competency offensively etc cetera, etc cetera. um my Baylor Bears, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm wearing black and mourning for their season being over now after losing to Texas State. Uh, the yeah. thing to adjust from that is uh, I don't know if if Shapin is out. I know he's having an MRI, but I believe today or tomorrow or, or maybe Tuesday, I guess, because Holiday, I don't know, on, on his knee. Um, he actually played really well. Uh, I was I was surprised at how well he graded out, uh, but the offensive line was dreadful. I mean. Mm -hmm. not even a decent FCS school dreadful against Texas state. And that's a massive concern. And that's something that I don't think as a Baylor fan, I'm overreacting to that offensive line play. If it doesn't get better, uh, right. they, they will not score against Utah. If right. that does not get better. You saw what Utah did to Florida's offensive line. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. those are just types of things. We watch a lot of football. We have a lot of good insights. And we want to, we want to try to share those insights with you. If you're looking for insights on games that we aren't covering, is a place to be you can get our attention at any time tag us and we will answer questions as quick as we can on these type of things but i will say as a baylor fan uh i'm, I'm not encouraged about about the way the seasons goes and, and thus i'm in warning uh cousin jared you're on the opposite of the spectrum i think you have to be excited about uh your texas and aggies and the the uh the, the potential on offense that, that you have not seen there in college station well, in, in a long time well since you teed me up here and you know everybody can just fast forward through this part we need to time stamp this uh Wegman averaged over 10 yards per attempt. I can't tell you the last time that a Texas A&M quarterback has averaged over 10 yards in attempt. It, it doesn't feel like it's been since Jimbo Fisher has been there. Um, he's the best passing quarterback that I've seen at A&M since uh, Ryan Tannehill was there. I, mean, I was thinking too for the last one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, Johnny was an amazing quarterback, but just pure passer, Tannehill had him, had him beat. Probably the best passer I've seen since Tannehill. Um, maybe the most impressive thing I saw is that literally Jimbo Fisher was being forced to do head coach things, like strategize about when he was calling his timeouts and ensuring that everybody was getting the plays in on a timely manner, not having to call timeouts because people weren't lined up right and all of that stuff. And so you could literally tell him he was sitting there and he's like, oh, I guess I should call a timeout now. Like, what else am I doing? I'm just kind of standing here. So uh, anyway, I, I think that... It, He's actually going to be a better, you know, clock management, all of that type of thing, because he's not calling plays. So, uh, anyway, yeah. I, but the thing is, you could be better in the SEC West, and it, you know, still could end up yeah. seven five, eight and four, yeah. something like that. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel better, yeah. but who knows how it's ultimately going to turn out? Yeah, especially with LSU looking, you know, poised to be good this season. Obviously, yeah. Alabama, and then there's always some random team. I feel like in the SEC West that comes up and wins like ten games. You're like, wow, they're the good team this year. It's like Ole Miss one year, one year it was Arkansas, or one year it's you know. Few years ago, it was Auburn, whoever it's just yeah. some random team will pop up and be really good. Yeah. Um, last thing, real quick, before we get going, the uh changes to the rules we did see a fewer number of plays, 
we did not really see a massive reduction in the number of points. We saw a small reduction in the number of points. I think the model handled it really well. We aren't making any changes really going forward. We actually overestimated the number of uh, points uh, that would be scored. So uh, I think for the most part, uh, I think we kind of nailed that pretty well. Uh, we'll reevaluate again after next week. After next week, we double our data set, right? So, we, yeah. so this is the biggest change. You know, week one is the biggest, like, whoa, what do we do? Week after week two is the biggest, like, okay, now we've doubled our data sets. After this, now every time we add, we add uh, less than 50% yeah. again. So it becomes a little bit more stable, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll reevaluate. But so far, I think we did pretty well with adjusting uh, for that. And we're going to talk about a lot of that with these totals. We're going to talk about a lot of pace metrics. Uh, these pace metrics, uh, as a general disclaimer, are not a pace of exactly what they have done this season. You cannot just look at that because obviously you would take a team like, you know, uh, someone who's only played one game because a triple option would look like they're running the slowest play in the world, but that's based off their opponent, right? So this is based off of previous season's data, head coach tendencies, and what we've seen this year. So these pace metrics, again, are not gospel as much as they are, just our best estimate yep. uh, based off what we've seen this year, previous years, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about a lot of these totals here and we'll get spreads coming uh, at you later in the week once the week is finalized we get final model projections. So we'll move on now, finally, to <clears throat> noon Eastern. Notre Dame at NC State. Uh, you know, NC State could not quite get the cover uh, for us against UConn, they looked incredible defensively, though. I mean, way better than that 89 grade on screen, in my opinion. It was only UConn. But the first series, they really were asleep at the wheel. Uh, didn't look sharp coming out on the road first series of the season. After that, they allowed one play to score off of them and otherwise just shut UConn. And obviously, Notre Dame is a much better offense. Right. Then UConn, and there are potential concerns. I think the potential concern I'm going to bring up about this game is how much are we downplaying what NC State did offensively because uh, maybe they've had a really vanilla game plan against UConn, knowing that this game was on deck. Notre Dame's already played twice at this point, but Notre Dame more or less had two weeks to practice for NC State, getting, I yeah. believe, Tennessee State this weekend. Yeah. Uh, they've they spent their time resting from that back trip from Ireland and probably focused on exactly all the things that Armstrong is going to throw at them. If I remember correctly, though, Notre Dame faced Armstrong a couple of years ago at yep. Virginia. So uh, the, the head coach, who I believe at the time was a defensive coordinator, has seen him. Some of these players, you know, obviously there's a lot of transfers. So some of these guys maybe haven't. But Notre Dame, really impressive team, ranks very well. You can see really good offense, really good defense. Uh, Notre Dame is, is a favorite in this game, rightfully so. Uh, I think the spread's pretty well set, though. You have two teams that play maybe a tiny bit slower than average. I mean, the bottom line, though, is that we're projecting in the 40s. The total is 50. We're going to go under 51 as a B grade, not a huge edge. Uh, but we think this game stays in the 40s rather than the 50s. Cousin Jared, why is that? I think that's the case because you mentioned overreacting. And don't get me wrong, that Notre Dame offense looked unbelievable uh, against Navy. Uh, but boys and girls, uh, I hate to pull against America, but Navy is not good uh, this yeah. season. The NC State defense is going to present a completely different kind of challenge to the Notre Dame offense than what Navy did. And, you know, to, to your point, I mean, I these these teams both have good defenses. I'm going surprised, to be surprised if either one gets gets very, very far away. This seems like a game that's, you know, 20 to 20 somewhere in the fourth quarter and then the last score um, decides it. I just think that Notre Dame's defense is just – Solid, and I think that North Carolina State's defense. You know, we we talked a, a a lot about NC State's offense last year with Leary getting hurt, and that's why some of their games are so low scoring. So they were playing second string quarterbacks, third string quarterbacks. But the reality is, is they had a really good defense too, and that's why they, they were did. staying in these games even with these second third third string quarterbacks. So again, I just think they're going to present a different type of challenge than what Navy did, and we're just overreacting just a little bit to what Navy's offense did in, in that game. Yeah, and uh, Navy's defense, I, I, I guess you mean. But yeah, I completely agree. I think that uh, uh, NC State's defense is really, really good. And uh, Notre Dame's offense can score. Um, but like you said, it's it's a totally different defense here. And so, uh, I, I like I said, I actually think the model might be underselling just how good NC State's defense is. Mm -hmm. Um they were really good last year. They looked really good. Obviously, <clears throat> you know, Notre Dame's a much tougher test than UConn, but, uh, you know, under 51 here is our pick. Uh, Cousin Jared, e e personally, how do you feel about 51 
versus 52. 52 is kind of a key number. 51 is kind of a key number. What's kind of key? Are, are you too concerned about that at all? Like, what are your thoughts on this actual number? Yeah, I, I think uh, – I think this would probably have to get to 55 for me to give it an A grade um, just to have that little extra space. And like, I do feel like Brennan Armstrong is a good quarterback. I do feel, I mean, obviously like Sam Hartman is a good quarterback. So it's not like we're going against two teams that are have throwing subpar quarterbacks out on the field. We do have, which we will do later. (laughs) Yes. We we will do that later. And so this is just one of those things. I think I would need to get to 55 before I would give it an A grade just because of the, um, you know, the talent of the quarterbacks that are going to be on the field. All right, moving on to the 3.30 Eastern slot, UNLV and Michigan. Uh, Michigan was unable to cover in week one. Uh, Their defense did their part, barely allowing anything, but their offense did not score enough points to cover. Their offense still grades pretty well. We're not going to overreact one week, but uh, you do have to be a little bit concerned that they aren't going to go out there and try to put up, uh, you know, 60 points in a game. They have no reason to try to do that. UNLV showed signs of competence last year at the end of the season and had a couple of games where they actually played reasonable defense. Um, surprisingly, there were times last year with you saw UNLV, it looked like they were just all offense, no defense, but occasionally they, they played a little bit of decent defense. That's why they're rating. Obviously on defense is not very good, but it's not as bad as some teams, specifically some teams we'll talk about later. Nothing really to talk about here on pace. This one, I think the model is actually giving it a little bit of an undergrade part of what the model does. And it's not overly complex machine learning AI where we don't even know what's happening. It's There are formulas that I've built in to do this. And what the model's doing here, it's shading that total down just a little bit saying, Michigan's probably not going to try to score late. We're probably not going to get the full range of possessions late. The model looks at the spread and adjusts based off of pace of the offense or the, the of each team based off of the situation how it projects the game to go this feels like a fourth quarter that might not have a lot of points in it i think that's one of the main reasons why we're on under 58 and a half a great pick and a pretty good number you'd like 59 but i think people are probably overly focused on the wrong number if they're worried about 58 59 this one really should be more like 55 uh so we got a bunch of key numbers here under 58 and a half to play because enjoy tell us more you, you touched on it right there that a lot of key numbers south of uh, 58 and a half. And so that's a big part of why this is an A grade. I, so we, we said take the Michigan over last week. Uh, that was on me. I seem to just neglect to remember that Michigan wins every non-conference game like 45 to nothing. And that's just kind of the, the general score they have. 35 nothing, 45 nothing, 35-3, something like that. It wasn't enough to get us the uh, cover, as you mentioned last week. But that's just generally how they play. Um one of the other things, Michigan only ran for 122 yards in that game against hmm. East Carolina, which East Carolina's defense is, you know, it's it's yeah, fine for a group of five. Yeah, for a group of five defense, it's fine. Um, but, like, are they a whole lot better than UNLV? A little bit better than UNLV. Maybe not a yeah. ton better yeah. than UNLV. And, obviously, I'm not saying that I'm concerned about Michigan's offense at all. But what I am saying is, like, if you're not getting really – They're going to go vanilla. Yeah, yeah, they're going to go vanilla. And you're not really just going to come out and try your damnedest to be running the ball all over – ECU, you know, you're kind of going to do, I think you're probably going to see a similar performance that you saw last week um, from Michigan. And so with all that being said, I see Michigan scoring about 42 points and I see UNLV scoring about three. And I would, I I would really be shocked if this game got in, even got to 55. I think it's going to be below 55. It might be in the forties. So this is just what, uh, this is just what Michigan does in the out of conference play. They kind of grind these teams down and they run the clock in the second half. They are not interested in running up the score. They kind of just want to get a comfortable lead and then just run out the clock. Um, And I think we kind of lost, maybe lost track of that with how dynamic their offense became, you know, when they had to play Michigan, when they're in the Big Ten championship game, when they were in the uh, playoff and everything, because they were forced to play that way. But when they're not forced to play play that way, they they don't want to. So uh, I love this play. I think this is way too many points. Yeah, I agree. And I think there's a little bit of uh, the love for uh, the UNLV quarterback who – very dynamic and a very good player, but it's a little bit of a different story going up against this Michigan defense. I don't really feel like he's going to have a lot of success. Yeah. These situations, the Michigans of the world, um, you know, the Iowas of the world, the Clemsons of the world, some of these teams, when they get in these non-conference games, if they can smell the shutout, they really want to get or smell that we didn't give up a touchdown. They really want to get it. And, and that's kind of what this feels like. If, if they aren't, 
getting anything early, even if they put some of the backups in later, that defense is going to be fighting hard not to give up a touchdown because there's yeah. that pride factor involved. And you might see that here. Uh, I'm like you, this is way too many points in my opinion. Uh, Models is 52 and a half saying that there's about a 50, 50 chance that it probably stays in the forties. Cause uh, the only, you know, the 51, 52 could happen, of course, but yeah. maybe 40%, 45% chance it stays in the forties. So it's absolutely possible uh, in the model's eyes. Uh, which takes us to an actual game that you might want to watch here. Uh, you know, we're never going to lose sight of the games that you don't want to watch, but we are going to talk about the ones you want to watch to here. Ole Miss Tulane uh, should be a fantastic contest here. Uh, we saw Tulane look really good in their opener. Ole Miss obviously going to be a solid team, but kind of as we mentioned at the top with the SEC, you know, very, you know, could have a good season and, and get up there and finish, you know, top 10, right? Or in the SEC, you know, you could end up, accidentally going seven and five, right? And still be a really good team. So we know Ole Miss is good where they will finish. Who knows? But uh, this should be a fantastic contest. Tulane, uh, you know, wanting to show they can play with the big boys here. Um, Model says that uh, Ole Miss should be about a touchdown favorite. I think it's where the line stands. So I think it's a pretty well-priced uh, spread. But when you look at these two teams – while they both have good offenses, Tulane's offense ranks a little bit better than their defense. Uh, Ole Miss offense ranks a little bit better than their defense. Of course, I'm getting that because our ratings there are more, uh, 100 is average, lower is fewer points, and more is more points. Ole Miss 19 uh, above average on offense, but 17 above average on defense. I mean, it's pretty similar. These, these teams are pretty similar, pretty good at each. Uh, Ole Miss is probably a little better, but it's not like – one of these teams has a fantastic offense and a terrible defense or a good defense and an you know, amazing offense or whatever, pretty similar. And when you look at their pace of play, maybe a little bit on the fast side, you saw it with Tulane a little bit on the fast side. There were times when they kind of got up there on the points really quick, but that Tulane game last week still went under for us. And so as much as they might play a little bit faster, you know, they can still keep a game under the average college football game has is looking at 55 points. Now, exactly where that's going to fall with the clock changes, maybe it's on the north side of that or south side, but you're around talking about the mid 50s. Models is 58, right? Models thinking, hey, these teams might play a little fast, but I'm not going to deviate too much from a typical game because the offense and defenses should be pretty evenly matched. Uh, again, Ole Miss is going to have a little bit of edge on both sides, but you shouldn't really expect anything crazy. This thing's priced at 63 as if. One of these teams just doesn't have a defense, and I don't quite get it. 63 is probably a little bit less key than 62, but nice to have it because when you get up into those numbers, you do end up with more touchdowns. And so the sevens become more important as you get higher in the total, so threes become more important as you get lower. Under 63 is a fantastic value, in my yep. opinion, this one, because, you know, what do you got? I want to talk about Tulane. We had the under 55 last week with Tulane in South Alabama, got to the window with that one. And Tulane's defense performed basically just as we thought it would. They only gave up 265 yards to South Alabama. And so, you know, kind of exactly what we thought we were going to get from them. But I want to talk about Tulane's offense against this Ole Miss defense. Uh, let me read you off Michael Pratt's, uh, the quarterback for Tulane, his stat line from Saturday against South Alabama. He was 14 of 15 for 294 yards, uh, averaging 19.6 yards per attempt. That's uh, incredible. Yeah, got to say, uh, he's not going to do that against Ole yep. Miss. Uh, on the flip side, though, Tulane rushed for 142 yards, but they ran the ball 38 times, only 4.2 yards per carry. You're going to have to think that that might be a best-case scenario against the Ole Miss yeah. defense. And so um, I just don't see Tulane scoring a ton of points in this game, uh, you mentioned the the pace factor. Maybe they they run more plays. They only ran fifty three plays on Saturday against South Alabama. So uh, you know maybe they run more. They're you know pro maybe close game. They're down. They're probably going to try to run more plays. But the quarterback's not going to be that efficient. And it looks like they may have some issues running the ball against Ole Miss, based on what I saw against South Alabama. So yeah, like, this is a lot of points for two teams that I think just. I mean, we talked about it last week. Tulane's defense underrated. Uh, I think Ole Miss's defense, especially against a team like Tulane, again, great group of five team, but against a team like Tulane, Ole Miss's defense probably a little bit underrated. And so, yeah, this this line is just too high for what I think you're going to get on Saturday. Because you're at 53 plays, that, that's kind of on the higher end now, isn't it, right? Like the days of 100 plays a game are gone. <laughs> now with this rule change, right, we will, we will never see that again. I, I mean, who's to say? We'll talk about a team later that ran a lot of plays and didn't have the ball for mm. very long. So we'll we'll see. I think there okay. are going to be teams that are still going to try their damnedest. Of course, of course, yes. And there and there's still going to be some 60s and 70s and teams that are up there. But uh, those are the and there are a handful of teams that in the pace ratings are up there in the 
140s and 150s and that sort of stuff on the pace. And those are the ones that are really going out there and trying. But I, I, 53 might be more than average. I don't know. I can't remember the exact number of average plays run per game uh, in week one, but that might actually be on the higher than average side because, again, we're just seeing fewer plays. Yeah. Uh, you know, then before and again, we, that's why we've adjusted the model to decrease the number of points. I'm a little surprised we're on so many over, I mean, so many unders here because I would have assumed that the sports books would be concerned about this and, and everyone's going under and talking about the fewer number of plays. But yeah. uh, some of these lines just are a little bit high. They started off high last week and they all got bet down. Uh, so we're going to try to get some of these unders early in the week. That doesn't mean they will be winners. It just means you got options if you want to try to go for a middle later. Yeah, it, we may need to timestamp this so people can skip this, but um, I, I'll, I'll ask you, is it possible that the plays that are being eliminated are the plays that matter the least and like they add less points to the total score of the game than like what your average play would? That's probably way too long a question to ask in the middle of the show, um, but that's just something that occurred to me. I, I think what is happening is that there is just a little – more focus on the play since there are fewer of them being run. And so I think the efficiency is getting a little bit higher. So mm -hmm. I don't know what's not being run or what it's, it's hard to say on that front, but I think it's just a like, Hey, you know, we're, we've got to focus a little bit more because there's fewer plays. So I think the, the right. office is just throwing less plays away. Not that they're not ready there, but you know, that sort of thing. Also, if you're at fewer plays, you, you know, you don't, you run your better plays more frequently. Right. So, yep. um, there's that too. Uh, moving on to Kent State and Arkansas. Uh, I mean, definitely one you aren't going to want to watch. Arkansas is going to win this one handily. I mean, probability-wise, according to the model, um, we're talking 96% uh, here for, for Arkansas. So not going to be a, uh, a win here for Kent State. Uh, so let's fast forward to <laughs> why we are playing the under. Look at that projection, 47.6. We're going to go under 58 and a half. And look at Kent State's pace, a 50. I mean, I think that's a little bit of early season asterisk weirdness. I think it's going to go up by the end of the season. Early on, you get some weird stuff happening. Um, but we're not going to see maybe a ton of plays from Kent State, who has to also know the only way that they're going to not get embarrassed is if they are there are only 80 total plays running this game. They know if they get into a game that has 150 total plays, they're going to lose by 60, right? So that matters as well. Cousin Jared, what are your thoughts on under 58 and a half? Oh, man, I have so many things to say about this game. So we run the under with Kent State and UCF. And then UCF decided they were going to get a 723 yards of total offense against Kent State. And UCF ran 81 plays against Kent State. 81 plays. And so I think what you're seeing is people are saying, oh, well, if UCF is going to put up 700 yards, why wouldn't Arkansas put up 650 or 700 yards? I mean, um, what was the game that we saw at BYU in Arkansas last year, I think had approximately mm. a bajillion points mm -hmm. in it. And so I think people are thinking, well, yeah, sure. Arkansas is going to get 600 or so yards in this game. But if you look at uh, how Arkansas played against Western Carolina, Arkansas ran the ball 36 times, only got a hundred yards on 36 carries against Western Carolina. Um, Kent State's defense is probably bad. I'm not sure it's too terribly different. From Western Carolina, though, probably a little bit better. Maybe not much, but uh, hmm. and Arkansas averaged less than three yards per carry against Western Carolina. I, I think the other thing I would say when I was looking at the uh, when I was looking at the Kent State and UCF game, uh, John Rice Plumley, I guess that's how we're going to pronounce his name now, uh, was, was involved in thirty eight plays there, either between passing or running the ball. Uh, KJ Jefferson was only involved in twenty eight plays against Western Carolina. There's not very many players that are more important to their offense in the country than KJ Jefferson is to the Arkansas offense. I have to imagine you're going to see, which is, it. which is why it was only 28 because yes. the game didn't matter. And the game was yeah. over. If the game yeah. matters, he is going to have the ball on his hands way more often. We all know that, right? This isn't going to be that game folks. Yeah. <laughs> so to say I'm, I'm going to anticipate him being in the game for only about 28 or 30 or, you know, passing or throwing the ball about 28 to 30 times in this game against Kent yeah, State. And get, and getting him out. <laughs> yeah, and then getting him out of the game because that's just one of those guys that you cannot have him hurt. They don't stand a chance if, if Jefferson is is hurt. So um, I think Kent State's bad on offense. I wouldn't expect them to do much more than what they did against UCF, which was six points. And I just think that Arkansas is – I 
they showed some signs of potentially not, I don't want to say issues, but like they weren't able to just really road grade everybody against Western Carolina. They might not be able to just road grade Kent state and they're going to get up by a couple of touchdowns. And then what's the point of having KJ Jefferson in there? They're going to pull him out because they got to protect him. And so I think this is just like a combination of kind of what we saw last week and just like the scenario that, that's playing out when you got to protect your no, number one, best offensive player for conference games. And I think they're going to pull him pretty early. So I, I love the under 58 and a half. The UCF Kent State game, we'll, and we're talking about UCF later, so we'll, we can kind of even loop back to that, uh, was surprising in a couple of ways. UCF, to me, treated that game like Kent State was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, they came out, and they did not run a vanilla game plan. They had, like you said, and I swore the announcers kept saying John Rice Plumley, and I thought it was John Reese Plumley, so I don't know how to say his name, but I, I, mm-hmm. thought, it was, I'm like, I thought it was Reese, but they kept saying Rice, I don't know. Um, he was involved so much in that offense. They were running so fast. They put the backups in who still were running fast. Mm -hmm. They did not seem like they were just like happy to have a win and move on. And you know what? If there's any UCF fans out there, I'm sorry. Um, that's typical of your school and your program. That's just the way it goes. They've always had a chip on their shoulder. They've always, I mean, that's why they've hung a national championship banner. Yep. Um, that's why when we went out to the Fiesta Bowl, that was some of the rudest fans I've ever seen. You could tell that they, you know, they feel disrespected. They feel like they are, they're owed something. They feel like they're better than they are. Now they're in the big 12. And I, I think that's just typical of a team that just feels like, you know, they've got something to prove, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. And they went out there and they proved it. They look good. And they're a good football team, right? Yeah. I'm not, I don't want to take anything away from them. It's a good football team, but, yeah. but you know, they didn't need to do that. And I think that's what we're looking at here, that Arkansas is not going to do that. Arkansas doesn't have anything to prove in this game. They have something to prove in a lot of the other games, yep. but not this game. And so I think that's the other thing with this under is we're kind of assuming this is going to get out of hand and the model saying that's going to lead to fewer points. It didn't with UCF because they just kept going and going and going. If Arkansas keeps going and going, they will keep scoring on Kent State. That defense is atrocious. Yeah, and that and that's something else I wanted to say that, you know, I mentioned that UCF ran 81 plays. Arkansas ran 60. Uh, uh, against Western Carolina. And so, I mean, 25% less plays, I mean, kind of adds up. 25% less points, we get the under pretty easily. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's the thought here. Kent State looked like they tried to go fast, I think, on their first possession of the game. Realized how terrible of an idea that was because they went three and yeah. out really fast. Why then they're trying to go right back on the field. Why would you try to go fast against a Gus Malzahn team? Like we only have like a decade plus of evidence saying that's not a good idea. Yeah. So uh, my assumption is uh, that later on, they really started slowing it down, trying to get into a nice, consistent rhythm. And they moved the ball a little bit on offense. They had a couple of decent plays. They couldn't really sustain drives. And that's what's going to happen. In Arizona, so they're not going to be able to sustain drives. But if they can at least get a few successful plays, keep their defense off the field, they can limit the damage and not get blown out. That's got to be their goal. That also leads to the under philosophy because they, in theory, should not be trying to get into a shootout with Arkansas. The models, again, assuming that coaches are smart. Um, we talk about with, with this with baseball sometimes, right? Where it's like, we're kind of assuming that the manager's doing the smart thing. Sometimes they don't. <laughs> There's nothing we can do about it. But assuming we see more of that later gameplay that Kent State had, there's uh, we see with Cynthia from Arkansas, there's still a lot of reasons to think that uh, despite Kent State giving up all those points, that was the product of a game that may not look the same here on Saturdays. So we love this under 58 and a half. Uh, you have to be a little bit more concerned about this one, though. <clears throat> SMU in Oklahoma had the under at SMU and that worked out pretty well. It was pretty easy pickings. Uh, there were, you know, a, a flurry of points at one point and then there wasn't a single point scored and, you know, until the, you know, you know, for almost like 20 minutes yeah. straight or so 20 game yeah. minutes, not like 20 real minutes. Yep. Um, SMU's defense, maybe taking a step forward, maybe not terrible. We're kind of used to SMU having a really good offense, a terrible defense. Look at those grades on grades on screen, still below average, but only barely now. Oh, you should have their way with SMU. Absolutely. Oklahoma is a really good team. We, we kind of talked about that a little bit in the season preview, thinking that there was a good chance that they bounced back. Um, you know, very much up in the air, right? We're not saying for sure we thought they were going to make the playoff, you know, but we're just saying like it wouldn't be crazy to think this team finishes the season top 10. Nobody would say that's weird, right? And the way they played that first game, uh, the first whatever, they were up 42 nothing after like the one third mark, you know, obviously that's Arkansas State, but. Yeah. They put up 70 some odd points in that game, cousin Jared. And yeah, we're gonna go under 
<laughs> 69 and a half. If, if there were ever a question if I am involved in the production of this show, you people should have no concerns. I, I am very much have some input on what we cover on this show. Yeah, because why? Why? I Just tell me why, Cousin Jared. Tell me why. Okay, first of all, uh, I, let me tell you. I, I saw some things from SMU. Well, actually, let me back up even further. Arkansas de- State's defense is awful. Like, the Sun Belt West is, you know, it, basically every Sun Belt West game, it's like pound the under, pound the under, unless Arkansas State is involved. And I'm talking about seasons past. I'm not specifically talking about this season. Uh, but it's just – been one of those things where every year you could basically bank on at least the past two or three years that Arkansas State was going to have a really bad defense. And so if you would have told me going into that game that Oklahoma would have been pushing 70 points, I would have been like, I'm not terribly uh, surprised by that. Obviously, it's on like, which is why, which is why we, but I wouldn't be shocked. The points, which is why we laid the points with Oklahoma, because we're like, Arkansas State plays fast with a terrible defense, which is a weird combination, but bro, you do you. And so yeah. we're like, if you're playing fast and you're consistently playing fast with the bad defense against a team that's way better than you like, they're going to have lots of point- chances to score. And sure enough, they had lots of chances. They could have put up 100 if they wanted to, and I don't think it would have been that hard for them to do it. Yeah, and so let's just start out with the basics that – SMU's defense is quite a bit better than what Arkansas yes. State's defense is. I'm not saying that SMU's defense is great. I'm just saying that Arkansas State's defense is really, really bad. But then I want to turn around and talk about SMU's offense. And, I mean, I think we would agree from what I've seen from Louisiana Tech, who is who SMU plays last week. I've not been impressed with what I've seen mm-hmm. from Louisiana Tech um, no. so far no. this season. SMU only averaged 6.5 yards per attempt against Louisiana Tech. And I am concerned if you're only averaging 6.5 yards per attempt against Louisiana Tech, you might have some problems pushing the ball vertically against Oklahoma because I I don't see that working against Oklahoma's defense or Brent Venable's defense trying to stretch them sideline to sideline. I I just don't think that's going to work out in the passing game. And the running game wasn't necessarily anything to write home home about either. It wasn't like they were gashing La Tech for six, seven yards a a carry. And so this is just one of those things. I think that we may just have like this – again, Oklahoma's offense is good. I think we have enhanced our view of them from how bad Arkansas State's defense is. And same for SMU. I think if they would have had that offensive performance against a team other than La Tech, you might have been saying, mm, their, their offense was just kind of iffy in that game. So I think that you're both going to see uh, much more challenging circumstances on, on for both sides of this. And this game, I feel like, ends up being like 41-21, to 42-21, some, something like that is more what I think is in the realm of possibility. The model projects 44-21, so there you go. Man, sometimes I just, it's like I almost like can look at these things. <laughs> um, I, I think this is a reminder, uh, key numbers, right? Obviously, 70 is better, but uh, 69 kind of a key number as well yeah. because that's uh, whatever, nine touchdowns and two field goals. Cousin Jared, is, is how much of a game plan adjustment do you think SMU is going to make? Do you think SMU is going to come out and say, hey, we like to play pretty fast. 130 is fairly fast. It's not the fastest. It's a lot to be faster, right? But that's pretty, pretty fast still. A 130 get out there. We like to run and gun, and that's what we're going to do. Or how much are they looking at that saying, you know, you know, uh, if we try to do that against Oklahoma, we are going to get ran out of the building and our only hope for an upset model says six percent they probably aren't going to win this game but our only hope for an upset our only hope to keep this reasonable our only hope to keep our fans interested at the half Mm -hmm. is to not get into a run and gun game with a team it's almost like we're talking about with ucf right with a team that you saw last week can get three and outs in a hurry get your Mm -hmm. entire defense back on the field, right? How much of that do you think are they thinking about that there in Dallas versus just saying, look, we got to just stick to what we do. Do you you think there's any, any adjustment there? Uh, So what, how I would respond to that is I think, and I mean, the the coaches know this a lot better than I do, but looking at it, it's almost like, well, Oklahoma definitely had a questionable defense at times last season. And I think SMU's probably up to mind that we can capitalize on that. But I also think, and again, I could be 100% wrong on this, but SMU go into the ACC next year. I feel like there's just been for the past couple of years, really since Sonny Dykes got there to SMU before he went to TCU, that 
we belong in the league with one of these power five teams. And oh, we're speaking, yeah, of, of teams that have a chip on schools that have a chip on their shoulder, right? SMU yeah. notoriously, notoriously another one of those, probably more so than UCF has ever been. Yeah. And so to me, this is one of those things like we're going to come out here and play our game and show that we belong on this type of stage. We're not going to try to necessarily change what we do. We're going to do what we're going to do. Of course, there's going to be game plan things week to week that you tweak you know based on your opponent and everything but for the most part like we're going to do what we do and we're good enough to be here and hang with teams like this just on you know we're we're good enough to be here so my first thought is no they wouldn't do that because they're going to be of the mindset hey we're good enough to be here we don't have to change what we do we can hang in this game doing what we do Mm -hmm. their their coach of course if you missed the comments said they are the only power three school in the dfw metroplex and i was Mm. like hmm when has the ACC gotten better than the Big 12? But whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I would probably consider the Big 12 better than the Big 10 <laughs> as well. <laughs> as, as much as the Big 10s get those two schools at the top. Uh, my, my dad and I were talking about this weekend. Who's the worst team in the Big 12? I guess now it's Baylor. But like coming into the season, your bottom teams in the Big 12, your worst teams were like Houston, BYU, West Virginia, Iowa State, Baylor, all teams that could easily have made a bowl game. Right. right? right. Whereas the, the bottom of the Big 10 is very different. So anyway, yeah. um, my, uh, my final word on this, uh, why I like the under, I think SMU's offense is good enough to move the ball against Oklahoma, keep Oklahoma's offense off the field, but not good enough to constantly put up sevens. Yeah, they're going to yeah. get a couple first downs. They're going to pump. They're going to get a few first downs. They're going to go for a fourth down at the thirty yeah. and turnovers. Yeah. That's going to run some time off because their offense is good enough to not just be constantly three and outing. And that yeah. I think is going to be the difference in this game and why this game's going to have a hard time getting to seven under the old rules. I think this game can get to 70, absolutely. But with the new rules, fewer plays, I think SMU is going to accidentally hold on to the ball long enough that's going to make it harder, again, from a probability yep. standpoint, less likely to get to 70, so like the under there. Uh, Cousin Jared, I think this next game is why people... Look, we're, we're, no matter how much we change, and look, we're always making improvements. And I, I'm see about that, right? You know, we had a frustrating week one, but the one thing you can guarantee from me is I will always be trying to make things better. I'm always trying to add more tracking metrics, uh, more things so you can see the results, more things you can see the metrics of what I'm using so you can see what's useful. I'm always going to try to get better. You can guarantee that it's always going to happen. The other thing, we're going to always stick to our roots and cover crap games like this. Yep. And, and you, viewer, Dub Club subscriber, you probably only see like 20% of the things that he thinks about changing uh, is what you ultimately change. So I promise you, you should run for office because you are always trying to change and be what is best for the consumer. So yeah. I'm yeah. always trying to figure out what's best for yeah. the viewer, the consumer, yeah. uh, which is a great time to mention. If you are a Dub Club subscriber, we are going to run an NFL survivor pool this season you need to be a dub club survivor uh, subscriber Subscribe. to be in the survivor I yeah mean, you Sub- will survive Sub- i promise we've survived exactly for a year now yeah the grand prize of the winner is going to be one year free dub club membership but you got to be a member during football season so if you are a member look for those details to get into that survivor pool if you're not a member sign up link in the show description get in free survivor pool. I don't even know how many people are going to click to, to be on it. And the winner gets a free year subscription. So it'll be a lot of fun and a good prize at the end. So don't forget about that. People uh, I almost forgot to mention it. Um, New Mexico state Liberty cousin Jared. Why? Why are we here? Okay. So let's, let's acknowledge. First of all, uh, we were on the over with Liberty last week got to the window with this one. So I, I don't we were on the over with New Mexico state in week one as well. Yes. And so here we're flipping the script and we're going under 58. And this is just one of those things where you saw what New Mexico, well, actually, I hope you didn't see what New Mexico State did against UMass. Yeah. Um, Liberty is just, even though, hell, is this a conference game? I don't even know. I think it yeah. might be a conference. It okay. Is, yeah. it, it's okay. It's a conference game. Look, look at me. I know my conference USA. Uh, this is a conference <laughs> game, and like I, I know, I know it's a conference game because Conference USA is the place for the rejects, and either one of these schools had a conference last year, so they must be in Conference USA. It's, yeah. it's just like some simple logic. Yeah, but Liberty, it, like just from a talent perspective, from a coaching perspective, from everything that you can look at, is just so much better. <laughs> than New Mexico State is. And the way that I think 80, that... 84% win probability according to the model. 
And, and so the way that I think that is going to manifest itself is that I think New Mexico State's going to have a really difficult time scoring points. Um, in the past, when we had Hugh Freeze as the head coach at Liberty, you never had to worry about Liberty in the big games. Like the big games, Liberty was going to show up and you were going to get beat if you didn't show I was, up. I was specifically going to ask you about how you, what you thought about that with the new coach because we banked on that last year multiple games and made a yeah. lot of money off it just saying big game – Back Liberty, not a big game, yeah. fade Liberty. And it worked like it worked like a really high percentage of the time. Yeah. And I I feel like Jamie Chadwell is going to be not, I don't want to say the exact opposite. Of course, Jamie Chadwell teams can win big games, but I think you're going to see a much more consistent team uh week to week. And so if Hugh Freeze were still there, this might be a thing where like, I don't know, I don't know. New Mexico State might be able to uh, find a way to to hang in this game. But I, I don't think that's going to be the case with Jamie Chadwell there. Again. Liberty's going to be able to run the ball well. I think they're going to get out to a big lead, and I think they're going to start running the clock, and I would be shocked if New Mexico State scored more than like 17 points or something mm-hmm. in this game. It, I, I think this game's going to end up being like 35, 17, um, something like that. And so getting uh, to go south of 58, where I think for me personally, a much more likely total of this game is 48, 52, 55 than it is 58. So again, for me, this is just, I think New Mexico State is not good offensively. And I think Liberty is just the type of team that could really take advantage of that and not only be more talented than them, but also just keep the ball away from them. So I always talk about sports books have a lot of things to manage when they set lines, when they move lines. There's just a lot of things that they got to think about. They got to think about who's going to do what, if they move this number here, what groups are going to come in and put money on it, that sort of thing. They're not overly concerned with balancing the books exactly, but they are concerned about making the most profit they can. And those aren't necessarily always the same thing, depending on, on things. They just got a lot to think about, right? We don't have to worry about that. If it was me setting this line and I didn't have to think about that, I'd set this line at 55 and just say, I dare you to do something because I don't yeah, know. Like right. 55 is the most common outcome. And that seems like the most likely result here. Liberty's going to score some points. Uh, UMass scored points. Liberty's going to score points. The big question here, and we've kind of touched about it a little bit in each game, right? But as a reminder, you should be able to identify exactly how you're going to lose every 50-50 bet. Every time you bet, place a bet on, on a spread or a total, if you can't identify the way you're going to lose the bet, you haven't looked at it hard enough. You haven't thought about it long enough, right? You ought to be able to figure it out. The way you lose this bet is UMass scored 40 points or whatever on New Mexico State. Liberty's going to score 60. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to happen, but that's the way it, it goes. And not that they score 60 or so, but if, if they score 50, say, 45, right? Like that's going to become a tough situation. That's where this can go awry. I like the under here because I'm like you. I don't really think Liberty has that incentive to do that. This feels more like a game to, like you said, get the victory, be professional, run the clock out, mm-hmm. get and don't do anything crazy because this is a team you should absolutely beat and there's just no reason for them to try to run the score there's no reason for them to try to get too aggressive there's no reason for them to do anything but a fairly vanilla game plan new mexico state was a great story last year they made a bowl but i mean you saw them have some quarterback issues in that yep. first game against UMass, how are they going to move the ball very successfully on Liberty? Like you said, it's going to be hard for them to score a lot of points. That makes it hard for the o- uh, over to happen. It's not impossible. Oklahoma did it themselves. Other teams, uh, I'm sure, in week one did as well. But you're looking at if it's hard for one team to move the ball, uh, it's probably going to get – I don't want to say how ugly necessarily because I'm just not sure how much Liberty's going to be trying to score. Liberty scored a lot of points this last weekend off of turnovers, interceptions. They got a lot of interceptions in favorable position. If that doesn't happen here, you know, when Liberty's got longer fields to work with, it's going to take them longer to score. Their offense isn't amazing, right? And this sets up to be a little bit of a lower scoring game. I think this totals at least a field goal too high under 55 here. Be great for us on that one. Cousin Jared, uh, we're apparently just going to do a show of nothing, but under North Texas at Florida International. Uh, look at that. Florida International actually uh, rates better than average on defense. I mean, just blow me over without but yeah. look at that off it's a 72 cousin jared this is a truly inept offense mm-hmm. if i've ever seen one north texas looked pathetic against california um we laid the seven with california had no problem doing so that line went down friendly reminder about half of all line movements are wrong in today's day and age that was not the case 10 years ago, but today it's about half of them are wrong. That was one of them that was wrong. People were putting money on North Texas, acting as if the travel is going to be hard. Cal is going to be traveling to Denton is nothing. Cal's going to be traveling over to the literal Atlantic coast uh, after game in a few years. This was nothing. Talking about the heat. 
those California boys not being able to handle the heat. And you know what? Uh, it doesn't matter when you're not very good. North Texas isn't very good. Yeah. You can see on screen there. It's just not a very good team. Unfortunately, since that's a team in my backyard, um, hmm. I don't really want to go see them play. Uh, two terrible teams. Another game that you probably don't want to watch, but one you can probably profit on. And I'm assuming we're going to go under again, Cousin Jared. Uh, well, no. Uh, and I know everybody is, yeah, I know everybody is shocked here, but I'm actually going over in this game. Uh, my, what, my two favorite bets that we've covered so far, probably the, the Kent state Arkansas under, and then this over 53 and a half, um, boys and girls, I have no words to describe what happened in that Cal and North Texas game. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I, I literally like, I've got so many statistics on my screen and I don't even know where to start. Um, but I guess the first thing I'll say is Cal had 670 yards of offense. Good Lord, Cal. Uh, Justin Wilcox of Cal had 670 yards of offense against North Texas. Eight yards per pass attempt, six and a half yards um, per to, to, to be fair, to be fair, Astros, because I don't want someone to comment this and say we didn't say it. And if you comment on it, I could be like, you didn't listen to the show. Mm-hmm. Cal, I think, is going to have a little bit of a better offense this year. They're going to pass the ball a little more. They're going to be a little bit more exciting. I think we're going to see a better offense from Cal. Yep. Obviously, asterisk, that doesn't mean they're going to have the number one offense in college football. Because if they do that every week, they will have the number one offense in college football, right? Yeah. We think Cal will be better, but like that's still kind of crazy what you were just Yep. Yep. Uh, the other thing that, that so, so let's start with the baseline. North Texas's defense is, is very bad. Um, I think what kind of make compounds it uh, really badly is that uh, Cal ran 95 plays against North Texas. 95 plays. And North- they were successful on probably all of them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. North Texas ran 53 plays, which that does not sound very impressive. But I would tell you that North Texas possessed the ball for 20 minutes in that game and ran 52 plays. Or whatever it was, and so imagine imagine what happens when they play a team that's as bad as they are. Yes, yes. You, you scale that twenty to thirty. You scale that fifty three up. You're probably talking about seventy five plays. Yes, yes. I think yeah, I th- it would not shock me if there were close to one hundred fifty total plays in this game. I think both teams are going to run about seventy five or so. And th- I think this is just which be look at the screen. Look at those pace metrics. Yeah. This I mean, this, you got two teams that that just they don't want to they, they don't play fast in the sense of we think of fast teams as successful teams. We think of fast teams as they're getting first downs, the clock stops, they're up there, they're ready to go. That's what we think of with fast, but sometimes teams are fast and they're still not very successful. And that's what you've got with these two teams. They yeah. get a lot of plays in. They just, yeah. they just get a lot of plays in. They don't do a lot of substitution. I don't know what it is. They run yeah. plays. They're not getting first downs and getting running plays, but they're running them nonetheless. And this is a volume play if I have ever seen one. Do not watch this game. It will mm. not be pretty. There will be lots of times where somebody's just running for two or three yards, but they're going to run so many plays that there will be busted coverages there will be a couple of long plays you may get a kick return or something like that so i'm not going to sit here and tell you that this game's going to go into the mid 60s i don't know if these teams are good enough to get into a game in the mid 60s but what i am saying is there are going to be so many plays ran in this game that unless somebody i mean goes really really into the depths of ineptitude i think you're going to end up with more than 53 and a half points so again uh this is me telling you to play it over here. Uh, and I'm telling you, it's not going to be pretty. It's a hold your nose. But there are just going to be so many plays ran in this game. We've long joked when Cousin Jared says, take it over, run, don't walk. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the initial run for this show was going to be nine unders. And I was like, Cousin Jared, give me an over, please. And mm-hmm. so uh, he doesn't like the overs, but this is the one yeah. and that is his favorite. Uh I, I, last thing I'll say on this, I, I completely agree with what you're saying about plays. You look at the pace metrics. When I when I was putting up the metrics for this, I was shocked at how high these teams graded out on pace. It, it mm-hmm. floored me. Uh, I don't think of these teams as fast because, again, I think of fast teams as teams that can score a lot because you're moving, you're successful, you're scoring, but you can be fast and not score points, and that's what these offenses do. And that's what we're talking about here, and that's why this play makes sense. Key numbers matter. Uh, 54 possible, 55 a very likely outcome. So on the right side of that, if this is 55 and a half, 
very different story. 55, a little bit of a different story, right? That sort of thing, because you're thinking you're taking away a good possible option and that adjusts your probabilities. But now getting that extra chance uh, yeah. for a win there uh, really matters. Over 53 and a half is a big great force there. Uh, UCF Boise we talked about <clears throat> UCF already. Uh, and just how incredible that offense looked uh, against a terrible defense, which is how fast they played. Boise State, definitely a team to talk about of, of the things we got right and wrong. And hopefully, you know, hopefully the last two plays here come in for us uh, so we can finish on a little hot note. Uh, you know, we talked about the TCU Colorado and on Boise State, Washington did too. But I felt like watching that game that Boise gave up a ton of points because of Penix being an incredible quarterback. Now you see on screen, Boise State's defense now grades below average. They were, so yeah, they were solidly above average before <laughs> playing Washington. So the model's adjusted, but I still think, so I guess what I'm trying to say is if Washington played a, like a normal offense, they would not have scored as many points. They only scored as many points because of that, but Boise State's defense did not look good. So we're it's a little bit of both, as in most things with life. It's a little bit of both. So the model is adjusting, saying Boise State's defense didn't look that good. But some of that was Penix. Now, John Reese Pumley, pretty good quarterback. Not as good as Penix. That doesn't mean he can't have that kind of game, but a, but a good quarterback. So that's the thing is how much of a drop-off is that Washington offense, which we know to possibly be top five, top 10, whatever, you know, possibly. I'm not saying it will be. I'm just saying it's, it's in, it would not be surprising if that offense just was very high up at the top of the season, uh, at the end of the season. How much of a drop up is to UCF? That's the real question here. Um, pace wise, UCF's pace gets a 90 grade. I, I don't think they're going to do what they did last weekend, but, but one more game and that's going to be on the other side of a hundred. So that's the caveat to this, right? Is that UCF's pace probably shouldn't be a 90. The model's not trying to overreact to one game, but they ran a lot of plays. They ran fast. They were successful. So I think my my analysis before I turn it over to you, Cousin Jared, is that projection of 51.3, that's probably a little low. I think UCS pace is probably going to be a little faster than that. I think that number that total should be a little bit higher, maybe more like 54, 55. But I still don't think UCS pace is going to be fast enough to get there. Boise State, we know, is going to still want to play slower. They aren't going to want to get in that track meet. They aren't going to want to do a game like they just got into. They've got to try to slow down. We're going to go under 58 and a half to an A grade play. I think that my total might be a little bit too low. But again, even if it is, this is why we always talk about the A grades being good. There's enough wiggle room where even if I'm off on something, we still yeah. have a plus expected value play. Because in general, what do you think? Yeah, and I would echo that and say so many key numbers uh, between 58 and a half and the 51.3 that you're projecting, or even let's say 52 or 52 and a half or whatever, if you think we need to do a manual adjustment there, still a lot of key numbers uh, between between those two. So that's what makes this so valuable. I just, you've said it for a long time. Anybody who's been with us for any length of time knows that with Boise, when you think you know what you're going to do, just do the opposite. And so you, I think it's really easy to look at that Washington game and be like, man, Boise has some questions about their defense. But to your point, I think that Penix um, creates a very, very unique challenge that almost no other quarterback in college football is going to present, no matter how good Plumlee might be. He's been a very solid quarterback. He just doesn't present the same kind of challenge that Penix does. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were talking before show that like some of those plays that Penix made, is like he just made a play. Like it wasn't necessarily that Boise did something wrong. Um, I mean, obviously Boise's not without fault, but – I mean, he just made some really good Sometimes plays. he just threaded a needle and just right in the in 40 yards downfield, right through like two defenders. And then it's like, one of those guys should have deflected it. And then it gets, the, and the receiver was open, but it's like, he had guys in the way still, right? So yeah. like, he was only kind of open, but he just threads the needle right through. And you're like, dang, like bullet passes. I mean, yeah, he looked really good. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, I would just say, I think it's gonna be really, really difficult for other teams to do that against Boise this season. And then I also have to say, Boise is a tough place to play, and I'm I'm sure there's something I'm forgetting. Maybe Oregon State has gone in there recently, but I feel like it's been a while since there's been a big non-conference game in Boise. I know Boise played at UCF um, a couple of years ago, but I, Oklahoma I, State might have gone up there. Yeah, and so the, it's, it's I think I think Oklahoma State lost too. Yeah, so it may only be like once every like five or six years that that Boise gets one of these kind of bigger uh, non-conference games coming into Boise, and so I think the crowd's gonna be good. I think it's gonna be a tough tough place. To play and you know 
I think I'm going to say the same thing that I said last week. I have faith in Andy Avalos. It didn't work out for me against Washington, but again, I think Washington presents a unique challenge. I have faith in Andy Avalos. I'm going to have faith in Boise State's defense. If they, you know, this goes over, this game goes over 58 and a half, come back to me. Maybe we're reevaluating Boise State's defense at, at then. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, shout out to Jack, who's uh, over in India for the time being uh, mm-hmm. on, a, on a job assignment. He, uh, if you remember him from season one yeah. of our college football show, uh, drop a comment. Shout out to him over again. Uh, you know, say a nice yeah. word to him. But he came up with this theory over a decade ago, and it's held true. If you just follow this theory with Boise State, you're only like 80% of the time. It's, <laughs> it's stupid high. It doesn't make sense. But Boise State has just zigged and zagged. When you think they're going to zig, they're going to zag. So just do the opposite. If they look really good, they're going to look really bad. If they looked really bad, they're going to look really good. And that's, they, I think last year there was one situation we did that and it failed. They had like two weeks in a row where they looked bad, I think. Uh, but other than that, I mean, it's just back and forth with them. And so I think there's going to be a little bit of value here. Um, yep. Backing what you thought went wrong in that game for Boise State. In this case, that was the defense because uh, that's just kind of the way it goes with this team for whatever reason. And it's gone through multiple head coaches. That's just the way it is. I don't know if it's about the athlete. They've it's kind of like Texas, right? We, we, we yep. always talk about Texas gets all the good athletes, but yet they always still manage to underperform. Whatever yep. is happening there <laughs> that's in the culture of who they're getting, there's something about the culture who Boise State's getting where they uh, – it's almost like the, the, the Liberty thing we talked about with you, Freeze, right? There's, there's something there about if they, they, they rebound really well, they respond mm-hmm. really well uh, yep. to what they did bad, and then for some reason they just can't manufacture that again. Mm-hmm. when they've looked good. So I, I like I like backing, again, what went wrong for Boise in the last game, which was defense, yeah. like backing their defense here. That leads to an underplay. Uh, Cousin Jared, this one's my favorite play <laughs> of the weekend. I just, oh man. Uh, we've got some some great games this weekend coming on our second show. We have not talked about Texas-Alabama. We've not talked about Oregon, Texas Tech. We've not talked about, I don't know, pick another game. There's probably another one. Colorado, Nebraska. Got mm-hmm. a lot of other great games to talk about on the next show. But... Uh, Air Force and Houston State. My huh. goodness. Talk about a team in Sam Houston State that can play defense, has no offense whatsoever, and really decided to use the clock rules to their advantage to try to hang in with BYU. And lo and behold, they did. Hung around. Uh, yeah. Covered covered 19 because they only gave up 14. They did yeah. not. The only time they sniffed the end zone was when they scored on a blocked punt that they were off sides on. Mm-hmm. It was the only time they sniffed the end zone. Other than that, they did not even have a H. Oh, sorry. The, the other time they had it, uh, they sniffed the end zone was when BYU went for a fake punt on like their own 20. And then they still didn't score, mm-hmm. getting the ball at like the 20. So, I mean, yeah. they just uh, ground that game to a pulp. And guess what? Air Force uh been doing that for a long time now. They yeah. Yeah. just eat up the clock they're 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 fairly good they're actually better than this offensively from an efficiency standpoint they just get drugged down when you adjust for that pace of play yeah uh, we're going to show you here on the next slide they mm. just do not play fast same you say don't play fast and i honestly think there's a good chance after this week we're talking about same you state space by the end of the season dropping into the 60s and 70s maybe not quite as bad as air force but even lower than that this total is 37 and i don't think we're going to get to 30 personally model says 33 but this feels like a game that's going to have like six total possessions in it uh yeah. a grade under i love going under games in the 30s it usually makes sense and i'll tell you why there are groups of betters with large amounts of money that will blindly bet in over in the thirties, they have rules and they will do these things. They will blindly bet unders to get really high. And this is a game that they're going to blindly bet over. So if the game is still listed in the thirties, that means there's really something here because a game that shouldn't be in the thirties, the betters will not list there. Like if a game is like at 41 and they put it at 39, they know they might get hammered on that. So when it actually is a 30, you know, like something's there. Right, yep. because otherwise they know the liability they have, uh, unless it falls under one of these exception categories. The pace on this one is going to get ground to a pulp. I love this under thirty-seven. We got the under uh, with relative ease in the Sunday game here. Northwestern Rutgers uh, in a similar situation with under. I think it was 39, 38, something like that. That game had thirty-one points in it, and it took multiple converted fourth downs and multiple really impressive offensive plays to get to thirty-one. And this yeah. game, I don't even think it's a thirty-one. Cousin Jared, what do you got for us? I don't have don't have much to say. Uh, yeah, yeah. I feel like you said it all. I, I, I'm impressed that sideline picked up so quickly that Sam Houston has a really good defense for a team that's just coming up from FCS. 
I mean, that that's a pretty salty defense. Uh, also picked up on the fact that the offense is not great Terrible. At, at all. Yeah, yeah. and to, to your point, like this is just the kind of thing that Air Force thrives in, like how many different – how many possessions are there going to be in this game? It feels like each team might get the ball like four or five times, and yeah. that's, that's going to be it. So yeah. um, I like this a lot. It, it's a really low number, but sometimes when you've got teams that are just like – on the tail end of distributions for whether that's defensive performance, offensive performance, pace, um, whatever it may be, um, you know, sometimes the model just can't go low enough or the books yeah. can't set a total lo- yeah. low enough for those reasons that you said. So, uh, yeah, this is this is like it's painful to do, especially since this is not Iowa, because like at, at this point, with like with Iowa, Northwestern, you're just, like, whatever. Like you're just like, yeah, whatever, we'll just go under blindly. Yeah. So this is like, oh, Sam Houston, what's the deal with Sam Houston? Um, but yeah, just. Take it, take it from us. Maybe one of us who may have a degree uh, from, from true. Sam Houston. Yes, one of um, my three alma maters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, go under this number. Yeah, yeah. They they definitely decided to use the clock rules to their advantage to limit the possessions, and that's what they know they have to do coming up. They know that they are talent wise behind almost every other team. Not every team, of course, but they're behind at least a hundred teams, if not obviously probably a little more talent wise. They know that they cannot, it's a smart coach. It's a very, very smart yeah. coach who knows he cannot get the shootouts. He knows he's got a decent defense. He knows his offense is going to have a really hard time scoring. It's the caliber of athlete that is up at this level. They want an FCS with defense. They know if they're going to be successful here, it's going to be with defense and they are going to, they're, they're going to be basically Iowa. That's what yeah. they're trying to do is mm-hmm. win with defense, play really slow. All, I was trying to score now, but they still can't. So that's a whole other story uh, for, for a later discussion. Uh, but yes, it, this just it, Air Force sets up to be just the perfect combination yeah. of just teams that just don't want to have any possessions. They want to play like a one possession. Game. They just want like, they just want to start with overtime basically. Yeah. yeah and I mean, and who, who doesn't think of Huntsville, Texas as the Iowa of the Piney Woods? Uh, but I have to give credit to Sam Houston for going out and scheduling BYU and mm. Air Force and kind mm-hmm. of, you know, coming up to FBS, kind of saying, hey, we're we're up to the challenge. We're going to do what it takes. And if that means yeah. getting our butts kicked, you know, that's what we're going to do. That's what we, that's, that's, we want to be in games like this. You know, this is the type of atmosphere we want to have and we're going to do it. So I have to say props to them for for not, you know, wimping out on the schedule. Yeah. Model says Sam Houston has a 28% chance of pulling the upset here. Uh might actually be a little bit higher than that because, you know, low scoring game, yeah. it's more kind of who the heck knows what's going to happen. I mean, we're limiting possessions. One, one, yeah, one one play can yeah. easily be the difference in who wins and loses this game. And that almost happened against BYU, who's a much better team than Air Force in that that blocked field goal had he not been offside and, and actually blocked it, right? That play would have completely changed that game. And that's the same sort of thing here. Uh, this game is, of course, being played in Houston at uh, NRG Stadium. So uh, Sam Houston is getting only a half home field advantage the travel is only about an hour down the road from them a lot of them have family in houston so getting a small boost for the home not like a normal home foot advantage of course air force also travel what, what should it matter though what time is this game i want can i go to this game what, uh what time is eight o'clock e- eight o'clock eastern so oh, no, I've, got better, o'clock. I've got better things to do on a saturday night yeah you told me it's 11 a.m you know yeah Maybe I would have gone. There you go. But, Last mm-hmm. thing I want to say about this game, it really just reminds me in college basketball, if any of our viewers w- were watching those shows or look forward to watching them uh, come college basketball season, we had, uh, like North Texas uh, played Charlotte. Was it Charlotte? I don't remember who it was. One of these games, there's like two teams are just ridiculously low paces. And when you have that set up and the model would project like 109 and the final score would be like, 50 to 44 or something. And it's yeah. like a couple of years ago, I had with some of the Mountain West teams a couple of years Might ago. Might have been Grand Canyon. Yeah, anyway. But yeah. Who's- and it's that same sort of thing. When you get these right situations where it's just that interaction effect of just slow begets slow begets slow. And it's just, yeah. it's almost like a triple option versus a triple option here because you got a triple option versus a team who kind of wants to play that same style of grind it out uh, football. So uh, under here, a pretty strong play under 37. And again, we've got a ton of, of other games to come in episode two uh, mm-hmm. later on. That'll be our second and final episode of the week. Cousin Jerry, do you have any parting words of the year? Nope. Just, I mean, last week was like Christmas and guess what? We get Christmas like every weekend from now until like the end of November. So let's enjoy it. Well said. Well said. All right. Well, thank you for tuning into this episode of picks with the professor. Don't forget to subscribe. So you can show the sports betting content right on this channel. Jump right into your feed. We'll be back again all week with baseball and with one more college football show to talk about some sides that we like, but as always, best of luck. And remember you can eat your betting money, but please don't bet you're eating money.